this is one that I've loved for a long time uh, and never thought that we would have the possible chance to ever show a print of it. Uh, and then a friend of ours who happens to be a film collector uh, ran across a print of this film and put it on his list and sent it out. And I saw it and I was like, oh my God, Psycho Lover is one of my favorite films. I've always wanted a chance to show it. Put it in the calendar. Um, we're just rolling along business as usual. I was in the calendar for, I don't know, several weeks. And then I got a phone call and it was, uh, it was from the director of this movie, Bob O'Neill, and, and he said, hey Lars, I just wanna let you know, I'm gonna be in town around this time. Is it uh, any possible way that you could uh, maybe screen one of my movies while I'm around? Because it'd be, it'd be kinda cool to come out and see everybody again and, and do something. I was like, ah, you know, unfortunately our August calendar is already built. What day are you gonna be here? And then he told me he was gonna be in town on this date. And I looked at the calendar, I was like, oh, what's playing that date? It's like, oh, we're playing your movie on that day. <laughs> like, what are the odds? What are the, like, it is impossible that that really happened. Uh, but like a lot of other things in this whole weird movie game, it's like magic shows up, this magic happens. The other odd thing that happens, and you, you'll understand why this is odd if you see the movie, is that we happen to have programmed the Manchurian Candidate completely without even making connection. Uh, and that's playing over at Slaughter this week as well. So. And you'll learn, that doesn't make sense right now, why that's a weird thing, but you'll see when you see the movie, uh, that it ties in uh, to this movie in a lot of ways. So I, I think that a lot of we look at these movies and we don't realize that like, people who made these movies were just kind of like people like us. Maybe a little bit more ambition, a little bit harder working than us, probably better looking than us, but basically guys like us, and women like us, who happen to be making these movies you know, 40, 45 years ago. And, uh, and that's the case with this movie. So it's a real honor to be able to welcome to our theater a guy who's worked on so many of our favorite movies. And, and this is one of these guys who is uh, one of these hard workers in all trades. Like we were just talking earlier how somebody had said, I need a prop man in my movie. And he was like, prop man, I'm your guy. You need a prop man, I'm, I'm, I'm the prop master. And then he goes, oh shit, I've never, never worked props before. What do I do? So like this is the kind of sort of spirit of making movies that these guys had, and sort of this old west kind of pioneering spirit. And so Bob O'Neill, who did that, worked his way up to uh, using his writing talents, using his directing talents, and making all kinds of great movies. Just at Weird Wednesday alone, uh, and Terror Tuesday, we've shown his movie Angel on the streets of it takes place on the streets of Hollywood, Avenging Angel. Uh, we've shown Wonder Women. Uh, so we've shown a lot of Bob O'Neill's movies. And uh, we're so happy to see Bob O'Neill. We're so honored to have him here. And I'd like to bring him to the stage right now to introduce tonight's film, The Psycho Lover. Please welcome Robert Winston. <laughs> Auditioning actresses uh, in Austin the whole time he's been here. Yeah, <laughs> great fun. <line. laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about tonight's movie. Tonight's movie, Psycho Lover. Yeah, it was my second film. Um, I had just finished a picture called Mother Like Daughter. Uh, I was working at a commercial house and uh, I showed it to him. I'd done it for like $35,000 and was shot it in 12, 13 days. He said, can you do it again? I said, oh, sure, yeah, right. Well, they gave me twice the money. They gave me like $65,000. Wow. Huge money. Huge money. I went out to a motel room in Malibu, locked myself in there for about 10 days. And I kind of had an idea about the script anyway, been in my head a little bit. And I wrote the screen. I called it The Loving Touch. And uh, Gary Horowitz was the producer. And, uh, his father was a line producer. And in the audience today, we have uh, Gary Kent. He was uh, my producer. <laughs> good, good buddy. And you and Gary will be up after the movie. Right, right. And I wanted to go ahead and say, after the movie, it'll be real late. I know it's a school night for a lot of you, and some of you have to get back. To, you got to check in with your parole officer and stuff like that. But uh, when the movie's over, I think a lot of you will be interested and want to hang out and uh, check out our Q&A after the movie, which will be with Bob O'Neill and with another special guest, who you pretty much just spoiled, which is Gary yes. James' yes. Yes. on the film. Uh, and so some of you are probably going to file out and just, you know, because you've got to go, you know, 
you're, you've left your kids at home alone or something. I don't know. But, but the rest of you who stay, you're going to have a great experience because there's a lot of great stories about this. Yes, go on. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Well, anyway, uh, I had a lot of fun. I had a ton of fun doing this movie. Um, it was, uh, and Gary will tell you this, this movie was shot just uh, before and during the landing on the moon. And uh, we had to stop shooting to watch the landing on the moon. And although I was so proud of that, it killed me to stop shooting, you know. Uh, I had a schedule to keep. <laughs> and uh, so we got a man on the moon, right? <laughs> um, but 69 was a great year for me. I did three movies yeah. right in a row. Blood Mania, Psycho Lover. Like Mother, Like Daughter was the first, then Psycho Lover, then Blood Mania. You know? And uh, another bad time date on this film is that it was during the Sharon Tate murders, the Charles Manson thing. And I'll have more to say about that later. And uh, it was just great fun. I mean, um, we had a magic crew, Bob Maxwell, I loved it dearly, a terrific cinematographer, you know, and uh, it was those kinds of people that we had that made it possible. I mean, we did this film maybe in 14 days, principal photography, you know, and then did some pickup stuff later uh, that I found that maybe. I have a sequence in there that's, a, 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 I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this, grass sled, where you sled down a, a, you know, a hill of grass. I used to do that as a kid in San Francisco on cardboard, you know. And, um, and we also filmed in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, we filmed in a place called the Japanese Deer Park in LA. It's no longer in existence. Some really exotic settings. And did some very, very experimental stuff with uh, white on white uh, backgrounds that allowed us to pull off some pretty wild stuff. Today you would call it Computer generated CGI stuff, and um, and working with uh, what the technique called uh, critical focus, working with very long lenses, micro lenses, and uh, we'll talk more about that too. Yeah, so so there's a there's a lot here to see. So uh, soak it all in, enjoy. And, and uh, one thing we didn't talk about before dinner: did the Isley Brothers have anything to do with producing this? No. I read that in a book. All right. No. We'll pass that on. So now other people are going to think that's true. Great. All right. The more popular, the more, you know, the okay, more producers, right. okay, great. Okay. All right. So the Isley Brothers had nothing to do with this film, so no. everything's okay. okay. So, Bob, we're going to go sit down and watch this great movie in a print that I hope is uncut, although we have no idea. Color's supposed to be really good. Uh, the uh, title in the print will be the Psycho Killer, not the Psycho Lover, which is what they called it in England, because they... You're, it's not legal to use the word lover in public in England, so <laughs> we're going to watch this and then we're going to come back and we're going to answer your questions and then we're going to probably create some more questions that we'll then try to answer and probably won't be able to. Enjoy The Psycho Lover. I'll see you guys later. Now, I want to say something about the print before those guys come up here or while they're coming up here. Uh, England has had its highs and its lows. Uh, I would say it's reached a, a new low. <laughs> and uh, this print is uh, its missing one really important, well, it's missing a couple little things. But it's missing one gigantic, hugely important sequence. So you guys can't say now that you've seen The Psycho Lover yet. But when I get home, I'm going to post that really super important sequence that's missing on YouTube and put it on the Draft House Cinephile page. So you can see what you're missing. It's a dream sequence that Marco has. It's like his, uh, his uh, psychic uh, post-hypnotic suggestion dream sequence. And it's, uh, I, I'm, like, I'm not weeping right now, but that's because I'm really strong. But I would be, normally I would be weeping because that sequence is missing from this print. But you will all see it later. Ah, uh, sweating. Uh, okay, I'd like to bring back to the stage Robert Vincent O'Neill and Gary Kent. Please come on back up. Robert Wilson, of course, is the writer, producer, and director, and then Gary Kent served as production manager on this. So, and we know Gary from uh, many years standing for all the great things he's done. I'd like to uh, not only just talk about the movie, which we want to talk about, but also just talk about their careers in general and uh, these movies that you also love so much. Here's Mike. Thank you. You guys work really hard on that sequence too. Oh, uh, yeah. Right 
Praise my heart. Wow, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm waiting for the scene. I'm waiting the whole evening for that one scene. Maybe they moved it around in the press some Well, maybe, maybe I didn't shoot that. I, you know, memory is fading. <laughs> That's it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Yeah. It was, well, I refer to it as a white on white. We had a white floor, we had a white background, and we had a white cove that merged the floor in the background. And uh, we used long lenses, and uh, we would do things like uh, shoot this exotic dancer and uh, roll off into white, and then start on white and come on to Marco. You know, and everything was like in a dream, and everything was uh, disassociated. And you'll see it, I'll, I'll put it on the, uh, what's it called, the internet tomorrow. Yeah, what's it called, the internet. <laughs> and once you've seen this scene, then you can just tell everybody, okay, I've now seen the cycle over. But as it is now, you're kind of in suspended animation. So I'm going to raise it with sleep tonight. I won't be able to. So it's a pretty wiggy, strange, arty film. Uh, anyway, even without it, uh, when you look at this. And one of the interesting things that's happening in movies, in Hollywood movies, is you look at the way that the big Hollywood movies were being made, there was a lot of that European film influence. But one of the things that's always interesting to me is watching, even in the, the drive-in type movies, you do see that arty sort of European influence on films. What, what was going through your mind when you were making this? Well, look, the idea is that people give you money to make this picture. You have to make it, you know, successful, which means a lot of sex. Yeah. A lot of nude scenes, a lot of passion, all of that kind of stuff. And while you're doing that, you try to do something creative. You try to do something different, you know. And uh, you tax yourself and do the rest that you possibly can with it, you know. So th th that's how those things work in it. Uh, the contrast of the lyrical stuff, the walking on the beach, the uh, grass sweating thing, all of that is to make the story try to work, you know, so that you're not just all hung up by sex. I think what a lot of people might not understand is because we're so accustomed to be able to go and watch independent movies as part of the genre in itself, and we know that we can go and watch an independent Sundance type movie. Well, those didn't exist, but if you were a young filmmaker and you wanted to express yourself through movies, you could go and find some guy who was like, I want to make a movie that's got boobs in it. Yeah. Say, okay, yeah, I'll give you some boobs. Yeah. I'm going to do all this other stuff that I want to do too. Isn't that kind of the way it works? Yeah, well, you know. Well, Gary it, it helped get us some really exotic locations. I mean, the Japanese deer park. That was an incredible location. Uh, the Huffaker house, you know, the boat. Getting the boat. And I got the boobs. You saw. <laughs> what did you think of that car? Huh? George Barris, was that right? Yeah, uh, George Barris. Car that you saw, we got from a guy named George Barris who wrote the book. What was that? Stars in their cars. Stars in their cars. Yes. Stars in their cars. Yeah. Elastic Press. I recommend it. You know, in 1969, there wasn't any such thing as a remote. You know, you see him press that pen. We, we, we all thought that was fantastic. That will never happen. <laughs> but Bob's right. When uh, this was just a great time in film that we're talking about. The late 60s, mid to late 60s, and to 70s, 75. That was the height of the independent movement. And you could get young, hot filmmakers like Robert, some other guys, Richard Rush, so on and so forth, could get the money to make a film if they put breasts in the film. You couldn't touch them, nobody get near them, really. Uh, but if you had them, you could get the money to make the film. Then they wrote these stories to make their real movie and you would have such so you'd get a little bit of money and you'd take that money and pay the cast and the crew and you wouldn't have anything left so everything else you had to promote like the car the yeah. boat the house what you know and then i mean i loved alfred hitchcock so i copied him as much as i possibly could uh his contrast between you know putting the focus on the hand prop and uh, that key where jo Joanne Meredith, wasn't she great in this? Joanne Meredith? I mean, yeah. She was just fabulous in this. Well, you know, when she's finding out, that's my favorite scene, is when she finds the, the tape, plays it, and her reactions to that tape, and each time he says, kill, 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 you know. Well, the business of, <laughs> this is where a filmmaker goes crazy about this stuff, the business of opening that locker, 
with that key. That was a macro lens. It was really, really difficult filmmaking to do, to make the key fill the whole screen. That was the object that we were trying to do, and it was, you know, the kind of stuff that you don't normally see. It's a very, very notorious sequence. Yeah. Notorious. Yeah, right, right, yeah, you know. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the stuff that Hitchcock did that was so great was to, to, to get you in on something really close and the next minute you were really high, you know, and the next minute you were down here. Well, I, I copied them in all of this. If you're going to steal, steal from the best. What, what, I have a question for you, Robert. What, uh, we both worked for a great director named Richard Rush. Yeah, right before my mentor. Met, how much did he influence you? Oh, uh, you I cannot tell you how much. I worked two films with him and Leslie Kovacs, uh, an Oscar-winning cinematographer. And, uh, and Richard Rush was so gracious. And these two guys, I'd watch them work together. I'd watch them set up the shot. I'd watch them talk about the lenses, what kind of lenses that they would use. And I would, because I was a prop man and a set decorator, I had to look through the lens to make sure that the frame was all dressed and everything. So I see them create this shot, then I got to look through it, see it, and the next day, see the dailies. I mean, that was film school in three months. It was phenomenal. And, and I think a, a big part of the thing that you were able to learn from those guys, I, I suspect, is, is, uh, is how to work real fast. Oh yeah, you have to work fast. Uh, you have to know what your next setup is. I would do things like uh, shooting a, a close-up on one person uh, and then running another character in to take his place or her place and shooting that close-up went into another scene as long as I could put the, the background out of focus. You know, maybe the same color and that, that kind of thing, yeah. And you don't get to do things over it all, right? Yeah. I mean, you shoot. Fine. We didn't even have dailies, if I remember right. I never actually. I did five films before I ever saw a day of dailies. <laughs> really true, right? And and what that means is that you have to film it in your head. You have to cut it in your head. You have to know what precedes a scene, what the scene is, and how you're going to get out of it, right? Uh, you have to know what the ending shot is here, you have to know what the beginning shot is here, and you have to know what the ending shot is here. And you shoot it that way, and that's the only way that it can be cut together. You know, so when somebody else tries to cut it together, and they don't know what you can have in mind, and they don't follow the uh, script girls book, they can't do it. I, I, think, uh, I think it should be known that this movie, this was a 12 day movie, so if you kind of do the math on that, it kind of makes you realize that you got to have eight minutes of finished film for each day that you shot. So if you think about that, every 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 shot's about nine seconds long. Gives you an idea. You probably you had to get maybe 50 shots every day, maybe 30 setups every single post, yeah. every single day that you shot. Yeah. Well, you had to shoot, you know, between eight and ten pages a day. Am I right? Sure. And then the, and then the locations were always 30 to 40 miles apart too. So yeah, I'm sure they were. You had to do those pages and drive 50 uh, miles. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the the beach stuff and the grass sledding that was post production because I had to know how much I had to shoot to make sure I had an 85 minute or 90 minute film. So I had to shoot a lot of film. The, 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 the stuff in San Juan Capistrano. All of that stuff uh, was done after we had cut the film together and I, I'm 10 minutes short, right? Okay, well, let's go out and get it. And that's what we did. You know? And I gotta tell you, the hardest work that I ever did in that picture was hauling that damn sled up that hill. <laughs> Boy, that was hard. I think when you look at these movies, you think, oh, it must have just been all the sex and all the drugs. Yeah. But yeah. it seems like when, you, when you're mindful of the schedule, you realize it must have been all the work. And I, had, all the yeah. I had wonderful actors. These, these people, not only in, in their talent, but their willingness to help me, their cooperative, never had a bad moment with any of them. Joanne was a dear Elizabeth Palmer. I don't know any, anybody any sweeter. I love John Vincent, the English detective. You know, playing him against Lawrence, that, that, that was great, you know. 
And then, uh, like I said, the locations that these guys came up with. Uh, another one that was hard to shoot was Arrowhead, right? And uh, the, the uh, race driver in that boat was a professional race driver. His name was Ray Caselli, and unfortunately he was killed in a race about two years later. That was his racing boat, or one of them. And then in the Manchurian Candidate scene, we're only like in two feet, of, three feet of water there, right? And off camera, you can't see it, but we're all in the water. The crew is in the water around that boat, you know, and <laughs> freezing your butt off, right? <laughs> Lake Arrowhead's cold, <laughs> you know. So that was a, a fun sequence, too. Another one that I, 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 another actor that I liked in it was uh, uh, the counterman, what was his oh, name? Oh, he's great, yeah, the Navy, I, I go back to the Navy, that guy. Yeah, that, he was a stand-up comedian, and uh, he came in and auditioned. I didn't even read anything, he just did his act. I said, you're it, <laughs> that's it. You know. So he was great, too, he was great fun. Seems like there was some impro improvisation in that scene, huh? It was, yeah, yeah. 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 I couldn't control him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we just put two cameras on it and let it go. <laughs> I, I wonder if you might take a couple of three questions from the audience. Anybody got anything? Oh, don't be shy. Right back here. Um, this is about Angel. Okay, yeah. Uh, any good Dick Sean stories? Uh, this is, uh, I should set this up. Uh, he's asking about the film Angel, which Bob also directed. You saw the trailer at the beginning. And you worked with the uh, legendary wild card actor uh, Dick, Dick Sean. Dick Sean. Yeah, I loved him. He was great. The great thing about Dick, he couldn't help it himself. He was another one that I had to put two cameras on. Every scene I filmed, and otherwise, if I didn't do that, you couldn't cut it together. You know, because he couldn't repeat a scene. Right? Exactly the way he did it before, because he would improvise and go off, and I'm saying to myself, this is gold, this is, I'm catching, you know, lightning in a bottle, let this guy go, do whatever he wants to do, right? Uh, he was a great fun. If you know the picture well, in the fight scene between Dick Sean and John Deal, right? He did that fight scene. Right? He, I had Vince Dietrich as the stuntman, and he said, no, no, I want to do it all. So Vince choreographed it, and, and uh, Dick did it. Worked really hard, at, you know. That was another picture that was a gas to shoot. It was all fun, man. Total fun. That was a huge, huge hit. Yeah, big one. A big one. international hit. I wonder if we got a couple other questions here. Right over here. Uh, do you know if anybody involved in the Venturian Candidate ever saw your movie, and if so, what their reaction was? No, I got away with the murder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I never talked to, I never met uh, Lawrence Harvey. Um, I did meet Frank Sinatra on a couple of occasions, but he never saw Cycle of I'm sure, so. Um, <laughs> suppressed the Manchurian candidate. He, he did. He suppressed it for a long time. After the Kennedy assassination. Uh, maybe right here. Yeah. Uh, Robert, what's the new film that you're casting? I did. He said, what's the new film you're casting? I made a joking reference that you're casting actresses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're not casting one. No, I mean, writing, one. writing. I'm casting one right now. I'm writing one called Retribution. You know, the log line is uh, revenge. It's worth dying for. So we're working on that. And then I have my writing partner here with me, Dennis Pratt. Uh, we just today finished, uh, we wrote a one act play five or six years ago and got pretty good uh, reviews. And so we decided to expand it into a two act play and we just finished it today. I have a pension for redheads. I married one. Uh, Luann Roberts was a friend. I, and uh, that's the redhead that was walking along the streets, right? Um, yeah, I kind of go for redheads. <laughs> well, on that note, that was a perfect question to wrap up the evening. I'd, I'd like to thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. It's great having you.